Hello, hello, testing one, two, three, can you hear me? I've got Spotify music this week, so I won't have any ads. Let me know how that music is in comparison to my volume, which last time I was told was too quiet. I, I will take the woo to mean I am audible. <laughs> I am Audible. I am replacing Audible. Okay, I'll turn the music down then. And I still need to figure out why my mic is quiet. Because as I said last week, my mic is uh, nice and loud when I podcast. It's often too loud and I have to turn myself down in post. But for some reason when I stream with the exact same mic, it's very quiet. It doesn't like to pick me up. Um, I turned the music down. Let me know if that's better. Oh, I think the music just had a break. <laughs> Come back, music! Much better. Okay, cool. Keep me posted if it's hard to hear. This week we are diving into chapter two of the book that we started in week one of Riff Raff Reads. Overthrow by Stephen Kinzer. It is a uh, history of America's century of regime change from Hawaii to Iraq, aka every time up to the point the book was written when the United States government intervened in foreign government to overthrow said foreign government. Chapter one was about the U.S. overthrow of the Hawaiian government. We learned that Hawaii was a country with a monarchy and there was an indigenous queen who wanted to give more power to the indigenous people of the country. And uh, the U.S. colonizers there, which were a tiny minority of the total population, decided they didn't want that to happen. So they overthrew it with a uh, threat of cannons and guns and all sorts of nasty stuff. Chapter two, uh, I'm not sure what it's about, but I see the word Cubans in the first sentence, so it might be about Cuba. Um, and I'm going to say the title of chapter two now, and I will give you a little uh, content warning. I think this is a slur in the title. So here it comes. <laughs> chapter two, bound for goo goo land. I'm, I'm guessing that's a slur. Um, but that's the title. Alright, chapter two. 
Let's see, let's see what the USA got up to in this one. The euphoria that gripped Cubans in the last days of 1890 1898 was almost beyond imagination. Their country had been racked by rebellion for 30 years, the last few filled with terrible suffering. That summer, as their uprising reached a crescendo, American troops had arrived to help them deliver the death blow that ended three centuries of Spanish rule. Okay, so Spanish, what we're learning here is that the uh, Spanish conquistadors, I assume, in 1898 had been fucking up Cuba. And then Spain was like, hey, America, you like interfering and <laughs> overthrowing government. We saw what you did in Hawaii. Good work. <laughs> Can you come give us a hand? So American groups, American troops went over and helped their fellow colonizers, the Spaniards. Okay, back to the book. Now with the victory finally won, Cuban patriots and their American comrades were preparing for the biggest party in the island's history. Oh boy. Oh, you remember it from social studies? That's cool. I, I don't know if I just didn't pay attention in history class, but I feel like all I learned was the US is the greatest country in the world. <laughs> Ooh, okay, cool, sneak preview. I bet we're gonna learn all about that. So it might be a refresher for uh, the di diabetic DM in the chat recalls these tales from the schooling. I'm really glad that that was covered in school. Perhaps it wasn't mine too, but I didn't pay attention or don't remember. Oh no, you can say spoilers, it's fine. <laughs> Leaders of quote, revolutionary patriotic committees in Havana planned a full week of festivities to begin on New Year's Day. Okay, so American and Spanish troops overthrew Cuba. Wait, why does it say Cuban Patriots? I'm a little lost. I'll just keep reading and see if it gets more clear. So they're planning a party. There would be grand balls, boat races, fireworks, public speeches, and a gala dinner in honor of the victorious rebel commanders. What does gala mean anyway? Ga gala. A major part of the show is googling words we don't understand or words maybe we thought we understood but realize we don't have a solid conception of them. Gala is a social occasion with special entertainments or performances. Okay, so a party with uh, performances. Got it. Um, so they're going to have that. Thousands of Cuban soldiers would march through the streets to receive the cheers of a grateful nation. Okay, I definitely didn't understand then what actually happened. The Cubans are grateful? Were they really? <laughs> Who was uprising here? We need a little bit more background on this, uh, on this story, I feel like. So they were, so there was a rebellion and Cubans wanted the rebellion to be quashed? I mean, I guess, yeah, that ha that does happen, such as the attempted fascist overthrow in January 6th of the year that that happened. You think they're talking about Cuban revolutionaries right now? Yeah, maybe it will become clearer. As I go on, um, just as the celebration was to begin, however, the newly named American military governor of Cuba, General John Brooke, made a stunning announcement. He forbade the entire program. Oh man, he's shutting down the party. Oh, they were rebelling against Spanish occupation. Okay. So the American troops did not help the Spaniards. They fought back against them. Okay. My apologies for my... Uh, misleading introduction when I implied otherwise. Uh, okay, so General John Brooke forbade the party that they were planning to celebrate kicking off the Spaniards. Not only would there be no parade of Cuban soldiers, but any who tried to enter Havana would be turned back. Furthermore, the general declared, the United States did not recognize the rebel army and wished it to disband. Okay. No, I think you're right, Diabetic DM. Um, I think, um, I think, yeah, because, because the beginning it said American troops arrived to help deliver the death blow that ended three centuries of Spanish rule. And then they were about to party, but obviously U.S. troops don't do anything entirely to be, uh, you know, gracious and helpful if they had some ulterior motive. And, uh, so as soon as Cuba was like, yay, thanks for your help, comrade, let's party. The U.S. is now like, nope. 
partying is forbidden. Also, we don't recognize you anymore and you need to disband. This abrupt turnaround out outraged Cuban patriots, especially the thousands who had fought so long and tenaciously for independence. So for independence from Spain. The United States snatched their great prize, independence, away from them at the last moment. As years passed, they and their descendants would watch in mounting frustration as their new overlord used various means, including the imposition of tyrants, to keep control of Cuba. Cubans were among the first people to feel the effect of the profound changes that reshaped the American psyche at the end of the 19th century. This was the moment when, with remarkable suddenness, Americans ceased to be satisfied with holding territory on the North American mainland. They became consumed with a grand new idea, that of a United States whose influence extended around the world. In the words of the historian Louis Perez, 1890 day, 18, why, do I, why do I have a hard time saying 1898? 1898 was a watershed year. A moment in which outcomes were both defining and decisive, at once an end and a beginning, that special conjuncture of historical circumstances that often serves to delineate one historical epic from another. All right, Perez. Territorial expansion was nothing new to Americans. They had been pushing westward ever since the first settlers arrived at Jamestown and Plymouth. In the process, they appropriated a great continent killing or displacing nearly all of its native inhabitants. During the 1840s, in their first burst of imperial war, they seized half of Mexico. Many came to believe that the United States had a, quote, manifest destiny to occupy and settle all the land bounded by Canada, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The idea of going farther, though, was something quite new. I definitely remember that old that old racist ass phrase manifest destiny that's like the main thing i remember from my high school history classes is that phrase like it gave me the chills <laughs> such a weird idea it's such a colonizer idea in the months after the 1893 revolution in hawaii which we read about in chapter one that country's new leaders sought annexation to the united states but President Grover Cleveland, who had succeeded Benjamin Harrison in March of that year, would not hear of it. He was quite right when he declared that most Americans rejected the seizure of faraway lands as not only opposed to our national policy, but as a perversion of our national mission. So what was their national mission then? Yeah, God wants us to settle the entire continent. <laughs> it's such a like, it's so transparent that it's just like, no, we can do whatever we want because the a made-up guy <laughs> he said we can and his word is final because we said so it's so funny um so yeah so back in hawaii there was a consensus that americans shouldn't be seizing faraway lands and then five years later this consensus evaporated almost overnight it was replaced by a national clamor for overseas expansion this was the quickest and most profound reversal of public opinion in the history of American foreign policy, which, to be fair, was a very short history at this point in 1893. I mean, it's still short, comparatively. Like the divine right of kings. Yeah, exactly. You can do anything you want if you say God said so. Who's going to stop anyone from just saying that? The foundation for this remarkable turnaround was laid by a handful of visionary writers and intellectuals. In 1893, one of them, Frederick Jackson Turner, published one of the most provocative essays ever written by an American historian. He used as his point of departure the National Census of 1890, which famously concluded that there was no longer a frontier in the United States, which all, the frontier was also a um, stupid <laughs> racist idea because the frontier was the concept that it's the edge of the inhabited land or the edge of the civilized land, which, as we all know, many, many people lived all over the United States. There was no edge. It was completely inhabited already. The only true edge is the actual, like, coast, because as far as I know, no one lives in the ocean. I mean, no humans <laughs> live inside the ocean. But who knows? I learn something new every day. That closed the first period of American history, according to Turner and left the country with a stark choice. It could either declare itself satisfied with its present size, something it had never done before, 
or seek territory beyond North America. In his paper and subsequent articles, Turner left his readers with no doubt as to which he believed would be the wiser choice. Oh, and then here's a quote from one of his papers. For nearly three centuries, the dominant fact in American life has been expansion. With the settlement of the Pacific Coast and the occupation of the Freelands, quote, Freelands, this movement has come to a check. That these energies of expansion will no longer operate would be a rash prediction, and the demands for a vigorous foreign policy, for an interoceanic canal, ah, uh, remember the canal? <laughs> For a revival of our power upon the seas and for the extension of American influence to outlying islands and adjoining countries are indications that the movement will continue. The movement, I'm guessing, being to, quote, expand the borders of American territory to include everything possible, I guess. The philosopher sailor who translated calls like this into a plan of action was Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan. Mahan? I don't know. It's M A H A N. Director of the fledgling Naval War College. Wait, Naval War. Is this a college for n navals? <laughs> college for. Wait, Naval War College. It's a college for Navy soldiers. It's very uh, specific. His book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, argued that no nation had ever become great without control of foreign markets and access to the national resources of foreign countries. Ship fighting school, yeah. <laughs> Sounds kind of fun if you just leave the foreign markets alone. To achieve that control, he asserted, a nation must maintain a navy powerful enough to protect its merchant fleet and force and force uncooperative countries to open themselves to trade and investment. A navy with such ambition needed a network of supply bases around the world. Applying these arguments to the United States, Mahan, should we, what are we going to call this guy? Mahan? Mahan? I'll say Mahan. I like Mahan better. Mahan urged that it not only speedily build a canal across Central America, but also establish bases in the Caribbean, the Pacific, and wherever else it wished to trade. Ah, so this is the guy responsible for all that nonsense. Whether they will or no, Americans must now begin to look outward, Mahan wrote. The growing production of the country demands it. Mahan was the toast of Washington during the 1890s. He appeared before congressional committees and developed close friendships with powerful politicians. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts, a leading expansionist, considered Mahan's writings to be sex secular, <laughs> secular scripture. <laughs> Maybe secular, I don't know. Excuse the background sounds. Theodore Roosevelt wrote a glowing review of his book and corresponded with him, with, with Mahan, on questions of sea power and the annexation of distant islands. These three, Lodge in Congress, Roosevelt in the executive branch, and Mahan in the minds of men, became the holy trinity of American expansionism. They and others of like mind laid out their case in different ways. Some argued that the United States had to take new territories in order to prevent European powers, or perhaps even Japan, from taking them. <laughs> you, you gotta snatch everything up or someone else will take it. It's like such a toddler mindset. Like when a kid won't let another kid play with their toy even though they are not playing with it and haven't touched it in months. <laughs> now it's mine! Others stress the missionary aspect of colonialism, the obligation of more, quote, advanced races to civilize the world. Military commanders realized that a more forceful American mili military posture would give them greater power and bigger budgets. Man, it's just, shit's just always been the same, hasn't it? The most persuasive of these arguments, though, always came back to a single essential point. By the end of the 19th century, farms and factories in the United States were producing considerably more goods than Americans could consume. For the nation to continue its rise to wealth, it needed foreign markets. They could not be found in Europe, where governments like that of the United States protected domestic industries behind ter high tariff walls. Americans had to look to faraway countries, weak countries, countries that had large markets and rich resources, but had not yet fallen under the sway of any great power. 
that's so funny so we had like too much <laughs> too much food and too we have too much clothes too, we're like too wealthy and so we have to go dominate someone else so that we can force them to buy the excess product we have <laughs> it's fucking wild this search for influence abroad gripped the united states in 1898 spreading democracy christianizing heathen nations building a strong navy establishing military bases around the world and bringing foreign governments under american control american control were never ends in themselves they were ways for the united states to assure itself access to the markets resources and investment potential of distant lands although the american economy grew tremendously during the last quarter of the 19th century much of the country's fabulous new wealth enriched only a few thousand captains of industry. Conditions for most ordinary people were steadily deteriorating. Oh, well, there it is. Okay. Back when they said that they were producing more goods than Americans could consume, it didn't mean that they had excess goods for everybody. It's that the rich had more than they knew what to do with. And instead of giving it to the poor people who lived here, they were like, we need to sell this to other poor people in other countries. <laughs> I hate us so much. By 1893, one of every six American workers was unemployed. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Jesus. And many of the rest lived on subsistence wages. What's that? Google time. Subsistence wages. Uh, substance subsistence level wage is a standard of living that provides only the bare necessities of life oh okay so they're not it's not like a type of a wage it's an amount of wage they're, basically it's a fancy way of saying they lived paycheck to paycheck um so just barely eking by plummeting agricultural prices in the 1890s killed off a whole generation of small farmers wait by killed off, do they mean they literally died or they just stopped farming? Not clear. Strikes and labor riots broke out from the New York to Chicago to California. <laughs> I don't know why I said the New York. <laughs> from the New York to the Chicago to the California. Socialist and anarchist movements began attracting broad followings, as often happens when shit be sucking and the government's fucked up. In 1894, Secretary of State Walter Gresham, reflecting a widespread fear, said he saw symptoms of revolution spreading across the country. I like that, symptoms of revolution, as if revolution is a disease. Yeah, true, they probably did. There probably was some of both. Some of them just stopped farming and some of them died from stopping farming. Many business and political leaders concluded that the only way the American economy could expand quickly enough to deal with these threats uh, the threats being the symptoms of revolution, <laughs> was to find new markets abroad. <laughs> okay, so our people are starving and unemployed. And because of that, they are starting to talk about a revolution to make things better for them. The only way we could deal with this threat. Oh, should we give them food and jobs? No, 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 no. We need to find new markets abroad. <laughs> Among them, saying this, was President Cleveland's Treasury Secretary, John Carlyle, who warned in his annual report for 1894 that, quote, the prosperity of our people depends largely on their ability to sell their surplus products in foreign markets at re remunerative prices. Is that, is it really remunerative, remunerative and not remunerative? Well, time to Google. Ooh, Symptoms of Revolution would be a cool band name. Define remuner. Oh, yeah, no, it is a, work, a word. Remunerative means financially rewarding or lucrative. It can also mean uh, just earning a salary. Um, where is that sentence? So the prosperity of our people depends largely on their ability to sell their surplus products in foreign markets at lucrative prices, basically. Senator Albert Beveridge, ooh, good last name, Albert Beveridge of Indiana, came to the same conclusion. 
American factories are making more than the American people can use. American soil is producing more than they can consume, he asserted. Fate has written our policy for us. The trade of the world must and shall be ours. Good God, our whole history is just greed, greed, greed. While, you know, while these American citizens, not even to speak of the indigenous people who are here, were starving and unemployed. Uh. Okay, meanwhile, back in Cuba. Cuba, the largest island in the Caribbean and the last great bastion of what had once been a vast Spanish empire in the Americas, was in turmoil during the second half of the 19th century. Patriots there fought a 10-year war of independence that ended with an inconclusive truce in 1878 and rebelled again in 1879 to 1880. Their third offensive broke out in 1895, so three years before this chapter started. Its chief organizer was an extravagantly gifted lawyer, diplomat, poet, and essayist, Jose Marti, who from his New York exile managed to unite a host of factions, both within Cuba and in emigre communities. I'm assuming emigre means uh, immigrant in Spanish? Well, why assume when you've got Google? Emigre. Um... Oh, yes, it does mean immigrant, essentially, but typically for political reason is what um, either political or social self-exile. And it is from French. Okay, so back to Jose Marti. His success persuaded two celebrated commanders from the First War, Maximo Gomez and Antonio Maceo, to come out of retirement and take up arms again. After careful planning, the three of them landed on the island in the spring of 1895 and launched a new rebellion. Marti, who, cons who insisted on riding at the head of the military column, was killed in one of the rebels' first skirmishes. Ah, shit. The first, one of the first ones. <laughs> Marti! His comrades posted his last unfinished letter on a pine board at their campground. In it, he urged his compatriots not only to free their country from Spain, but also to prevent, by the independence of Cuba, the United States from spreading over the West Indies and falling with that added weight upon other lands of our America. Damn, he had some like serious foresight about what the United States was up to. The rebel army made steady progress, and the Spanish commander, General Valeriano Whaler, Weiler? I think it's Weiler. W-E-Y-L-E-R. Valeriano Weiler adopted radical tactics to blunt its advance. So this is a Spanish guy. He ordered his troops to force huge numbers of Cubans into fortified camps where thousands died and declared much of the countryside a free, a free fire zone. Rebels responded by burning farms, slaughtering herds of cattle, and destroying sugar mills. Soon, much of the population was starving, bitterly angry, and more passionate than ever in its support for independence. In the spring of 1897, William McKinley, oh, isn't there like a McKinleyville around these parts? Um, he was a Republican who was supported by Midwestern business interests, succeeded the anti-imperialist Democrat Grover Cleveland as president of the United States. Oh yeah, so back in these days, um, Weren't Republicans and Democrats sort of the opposite vibe as they are now? Like the Democrats were more conservative and the Republicans were more? I don't know. Although anti-imperialist sounds good. <laughs> I don't know enough about it. Like most Americans, McKinley had long considered Spanish rule to be a blight on Cuba. Okay, good, agree. The prospect of the Cubans governing themselves, however, alarmed him even more. Okay, <laughs> racist. <laughs> he worried that an independent Cuba would become too assertive and not do Washington's bidding. Okay, so he, so he only disapproved of the Spanish rule on Cuba because he wanted to rule them. <laughs> McKinley had reason to worry. Cuban rebel leaders were promising that once in power, they would launch sweeping social reforms, starting with land redistribution. Hell yeah. 
That struck fear into the hearts of American businessmen, who had more than $50 million invested on the island, most of it in agriculture. Well, why the fuck you invest your money there? Get it out. Early in 1898, McKinley decided it was time to send both sides in the conflict a strong message. He ordered the battleship Maine to leave its place in the Atlantic fleet and head for Havana. I think I think that was the same ship that um, played a key role in the in chapter one. There was a, a ship um, that they sent to Hawaii with a bunch of troops and fucked everything up. I mean, they didn't actually fire any bullets, but it's still it, you know it was a threat. Um, which is probably what's happening here. Officially, the Maine was simply making a friendly visit, but no one in Cuba took that explanation seriously. All realized that she was serving as a, quote, gunboat calling card, a symbol of America's determination to control the course of events in the Caribbean. For three weeks, she lay quietly at anchor in Havana. Then, on the night of February 15th, 1898, she was torn apart by a tremendous explosion. Called it! <laughs> yep. Diabetic DM predicted the story. <laughs> the his story. More than 250 American sailors perished in the explosion. News of the disaster electrified the United States. All assumed that Spain was responsible, and when the Navy issued a report blaming the disaster on an external explosion, their assumptions turned to certainty. Many Americans already felt a passionate hatred for Spanish colonialism and a romantic attachment to the idea of Cuba Libre. Wait, was... I want to know more about that. Americans hated Spanish colonialism? Is that Was that just like... Um, like non-ethnic ra racism? Does that make sense? Like... Because, um, you know, at this point, Americans were... Were essentially Europeans. Um, not very... Uh, um, hadn't been very many generations since they were just straight up people from Europe, which of which Spain is part of. Um, so do they, did they hate them just because they're like, no, that's our, we want to colonize that country. <laughs> or did they actually, um, did they actually, you know, hate them for the right reasons? <laughs> I don't know. And I don't know if the book will tell me. Uh, but it is telling me where the emotions came from. It says... Uh, oh. Thanks, Moobot! Sorry, it made me miss Rain's message, though. Nah, dude, Americans are Americans now. Probably a little bit of both. Yeah. Uh, where was I? Their emotions had been fired by a series of wildly sensational newspaper reports that together constitute one of the most shameful episodes in the history of the American press. William Randolph Hearst, the owner of the New York Journal and a string of other newspapers across the country, had been attracting readers for months with vivid denunciations of Spanish colonialists. Oh, okay, so they were stoked. Uh, their fire was stoked up by the newspaper. Like countless others who have sought to set the United States on the path to war, he, he being William Rand Randolph Hearst, knew that he needed a villain, an individual on whom he could focus the public's outrage. The King of Spain was at that moment a 14-year-old boy, and the regent, his mother, was an Austrian princess, so neither one of them would do. Hearst settled on General Wait Weiler, so that's the, the Spanish general that we heard about earlier, and published a series of blood-curdling stories that made him the personification of evil, mm, which is something we've seen time and again. Weiler the Brute, the devastator of haciendas and the out outrager of women, is pitiless, cold, an exterminator of men, ran one such account. There is nothing to prevent his carnal animal brain from running riot with itself in inventing tortures and infamies of bloody debauchery. Okay, so that's why the Americans hated the Spanish, because they were um, reading a comic book <laughs> about... I mean, I'm sure General Weiler was a terrible dude, um, but I don't know that if people pay that much attention to terrible people in the world unless they get a fun story about it. The moment Hearst heard about the sinking of the Maine, he recognized it as a great opportunity. For weeks after the explosion, he filled page after page with mendacious scoops, quote, which were fabricated interviews with unnamed government officials and declarations that the battleship had been, quote, destroyed by treachery and split in two by an enemy's secret infernal machine. So he just, he just straight up 
wrote fake interviews. That's wild. I guess, didn't he like invent newspapers? So I guess he had no standards because he was like, I, I made this shit up. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. The journal's daily circulation doubled in four weeks. Other newspapers joined the frenzy and their campaign brought Americans to near hysteria. With such intense emojins, emojin, <laughs> with such intense emojis surging through the United States, it was easy for McKinley to turn aside repeated offers from the new Spanish Prime Minister, Praxedes Sagasta, to resolve the Cuban conflict peacefully. Sagasta was a modernizing liberal who understood that his country's colonial policies had brought its empire to the brink of collapse. Immediately after taking office in 1897, he replaced the hated Weiler and then tried to placate the rebels by offering them home rule. Whatever home rule means. You could, you can come home and rule. <laughs> you come home, I'll tell you, you rule every day. Good morning, you rule. The rebels, sensing that their victory was at hand, rejected his offer. That made Sagasta all the more eager to sue for peace. And several times during the spring of 1898, he offered to negotiate a settlement with the United States. Dismissing these overtures as insincere, McKinley and his supporters said that they had lost patience with Spain and were determined to resolve the Cuban situation by force of arms. Okay, so basically what this is saying is that even though Hearst back in the US was saying like, basically telling people, the, oh, the villain, General... Weiler, he blew up our ship. He wasn't even actually the governor anymore. It sounds like. Maybe he wasn't even there. I don't know. Behind their tough talk lay an obvious fact. Negotiations would most likely have led to an independent Cuba where neither the United States nor any other country would have military bases. This was hardly the outcome McKinley wanted, and it would have horrified expansionists like Roosevelt, Lodge, and Mahan. Lodge went so far as to warn McKinley that if he did not intervene, he would kill Republican chances in that year's election. I, the word kill in there made me say that in the wrong tone because I thought I, thought I was going to say he would, he would kill all the Republicans. <laughs> it's a very loaded word to use in a chapter like about, you know, violent uh, like uprisings and stuff. So Lodge said, if the war in Cuba drags on through the summer with nothing done, he told the president, we shall go down to the greatest defeat ever known. <laughs> what a drama queen. Years later, the historian Samuel Elliott Morrison surveyed Spain's efforts to resolve the Cuban crisis peacefully and concluded any president with a backbone would have seized this opportunity for an honorable solution. Such a solution, however, would have denied the United States the prizes it sought. The prizes being owning other lands. They could be won only by conquest. McKinley understood this, and on April 11th, he asked Congress to authorize forcible intervention in Cuba. This step alarmed Cuban revolutionary leaders. <laughs> that makes sense. It's alarming. They had long believed that, in General Maceo's words, it would be better to rise or fall without help than to con than to contract debts of gratitude with such a powerful neighbor. The rebels' legal counsel in New York, Horatio Rubens, warned that American intervention would be taken as nothing less than a declaration of war by the United States against the Cuban Revolution, and vowed that rebel forces would resist any American attempt to take the island with force of arms as bitterly and tenaciously as we have fought the armies of Spain. So yeah, if you stick your nose in here, we're going to treat you just like these other motherfuckers that have been <laughs> pulling bullshit. Protests like these had a great effect in Washington, where the cry of Cuba Libre stirred many hearts. Members of Congress were reluctant to vote for McKinley's war resolution as long as the Cuban people opposed it. They had refused to annex Hawaii after it became clear that most Hawaiians were against the idea. Well, that's pretty uh, um, impressive of Congress at the time. Now, five years later, Americans, American citizens, were showing the same reluctance. Many were uncomfortable with the idea of sending soldiers to aid a movement that did not want American help. To secure congressional support for intervention in Cuba, McKinley agreed to accept an extraordinary amendment offered by Senator Henry Teller of Colorado. It began by declaring that the people of the island of Cuba are, and of right, ought to be free and independent, and ended with a solemn pledge. 
the pledge being, the United States hereby de disclaims any disposition or intention to exercise sovereignty, jurisdiction, or control over said island except for the pacification thereof, and asserts its determination when that is accomplished to leave the government and control of the island to its people. The Senate approved it unanimously. Okay, and we already know from the opening to the chapter that they <laughs> immediately went back on that. So they basically told a lie. They didn't have American, they didn't have support from American citizens or from Congress to do what they wanted to do, which was go take the place of Spain in, um, uh, you know, being shitty on Cuba. And so they lied and they're like, oh, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. <laughs> we just want to go hang out and, you know, we'll help get rid of these bad guys and then we will leave and let them do their do their thing. And then the Senate was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the American people were like, yeah, 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 that sounds good. <sighs> that promise, which came to be known as the Teller Amendment, calmed the rebels' fears. It is true that they have not entered into an accord with our government, wrote one of their leaders, General Calixto Garcia, but they have recognized our right to be free, and that is enough for me. No, General Garcia, it's not enough. It's not enough. <laughs> On April 25th, Congress declared that a state of war existed between the United States and Spain. Members of the House of Representatives celebrated their vote by breaking into rousing choruses of Dixie and the Battle Hymn of the Republic as they left the chamber. A spirit of wild jingoism seems to have taken possession of this usually conservative body, McKinley's secretary wrote in his diary. That's interesting. So they were usually like kind of, you know, uptight and shit. And then they were all like singing and stuff when they declared war on Spain. I guess because they really... <laughs> They said earlier that they really hated Spaniards, <laughs> for whatever reason. A nation that was still recovering from the bitter divisions of the Civil War finally had a cause everyone could embrace. President McKinley called for 125,000 military volunteers, and more than twice that number poured into recruiting stations. Wow, and you know how much of that was, like, thanks to the the biggest newspaper in the country that we that we heard about earlier hearst and his stories about how evil spain was and how evil general uh weiler was which i'm not saying that's not true but he was um talking about it in this very like sensational and and, and biased way like you can talk about evil people without being biased and i suspect it was biased the new york journal speaking of hearst's newspaper suggested that heroic athletes like the baseball star Cap Anson and the boxing cha champion Gentleman Jim Corbett be recruited to lead an elite unit in the army. <laughs> Not to be outdone, the rival New York World published an article by Buffalo Bill Cody headlined, How I Could Drive the Spaniards from Cuba with 30,000 Braves. Oh no. So <laughs> Sorry for the... Um, I That's a like baseball team or something, right? But, you know, it's not... Using a native name, I believe is what he's saying. Anyway, everyone's acting like a fool, essentially. Theodore Roosevelt announced that he would quit his post as Assistant Secretary of the Navy to raise and lead a fighting unit. It was a war entered without misgivings and in the noblest frame of mind. The military historian Walter Millis wrote 30 years later, Seldom can history have recorded a plainer case of military aggression. Yet, seldom has a war been started in so profound a conviction of its righteousness. I don't know. Uh, doesn't this just sound like every time we've um, gotten involved in other countries? I guess it's except for chapter one, but um, I guess yeah, I, yeah. Okay, this was the first time we've done it, but this is the same. <laughs> this is the same sentiment that they're going to be re repeating for the next hundred whatever years, which is fascinating that the same um, social bullshit works uh, on these different generations with different access to information and you know we have access to so much more information and perspectives than they did back then and yet the majority of people still fall for these lies events moved quickly in the weeks that followed roosevelt ordered commodore george dewey to proceed to manila bay in the philippines and destroy the spanish fleet that had been deployed there 
This Dewey did with astonishing ease in a single day, May 1st, after giving his famous command, you may fire when you're ready, ready Gridley, <laughs> the, the delivery of which I botched. Six weeks later, American soldiers landed near Santiago and Cuba's southeastern coast. They fought three one-day battles, the most famous being the one in which Roosevelt, dressed in a uniform he had ordered from Brooks Brothers, led a charge up Kettle Hill, later called San Juan Hill. On July 3rd, American cruisers destroyed the few decrepit Spanish naval vessels anchored at Santiago. The Spanish forces soon ended their resistance, and the Cuban and American commanders, Generals Calixto Garcia and William Shafter, prepared to accept their formal surrender. Before the ceremony, though, Shafter astonished Garcia by sending him a message saying that he could not participate in the ceremony or even enter Santiago. That was the first hint that the United States would not keep the promise that Congress had made when it passed the Teller Amendment. On August 12th, barely two months after the American landing, diplomats representing Spain and the United States met at the White House and signed a protocol of peace that ended the war. Just 385 Americans had been killed in action, Barely more than Sioux Native Americans had been killed at Little Bighorn in the country's last major military engagement 22 years before. About 2,000 more died later of wounds and disease, but even that number was less than had fallen in single afternoons during intense battles of the Civil War. It had been, in the words of the American statesman John Hay, a splendid little war. <laughs> Isn't that the way with the <laughs> people in power, these fucking... The generals, I guess not the generals because they might be in the battle, but these people sitting safely in their little fucking white houses and capital buildings are like, oh, a splendid little war. Only 335 people with, you know, hundreds of people who love them, and families, children, wives. Only 385 of them died. How lovely. Charming. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can be glad at a low loss of people, but to be like delighted by it <laughs> is goofy with victory won the time had come for the united states to begin its withdrawal and in the words of the teller amendment leave the government in control of its island to its people instead it did the opposite in the united states enthusiasm for cuban independence faded quickly white law raid the publisher of the new york tribune and the journalist closest to president mckinley proclaimed the absolute necessity of controlling Cuba for our own defense and rejected the Teller Amendment as a self-denying ordinance possibly only in a moment of national hysteria. <laughs> so this is one of the newspaper guys that deliberately stirred up the hysteria uh, until it led to the writing of this amendment. And now he's like, oh, no, no, we can't take that amendment seriously. We, we wrote that in a moment of hysteria that I drummed up. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> Senator Beveridge said it was not binding because Congress had approved it in a moment of impulsive but mistaken generosity. <laughs> yeah, we're all trying to find the guy who did this. <laughs> uh, a moment of impulsive but mistaken generosity. Oh my god. The New York Times asserted that Americans had a higher obligation than strict fidelity to ill-advised promises and must become permanent possessors of Cuba if the Cubans prove to be altogether incapable of self-government. Oh my god. If they- we don't think they're capable of taking care of themselves and so we must own them. <laughs> That's not racist at all. These pillars of American democracy were arguing quite explicitly that the United States was not obligated to keep promises embodied in law if those promises were later deemed to have been unwisely made. Over the next year, they and others justified this remarkable argument through a series of propositions. All were calculated to soothe the public conscience, and all were largely or completely false. The first of these propositions was that American fighters, not Cubans, had expelled the Spanish from Cuba. Newspaper reporters told their credulous readers that when cred credulous? 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 that when the U.S. Army arrived, it found the Cuban rebel force in desperate straits, threatened with collapse, and bogged down in a bitter stalemate. Quite the opposite was true. 
After three years of continual fighting, Cuban rebels had won control of most of the island. They had forced the hungry and disease-plagued Spanish army to withdraw into guarded enclaves and had made plans to attack Santiago and other cities. They were headed towards victory already when the Americans landed. The second myth that Americans were led to embrace was that Cuban revolutionaries were cowardly laggards who had watched in bewildered admiration while Americans defeated the Spanish army. <laughs> it makes me so angry. Uh, one newspaper correspondent reported, This ally has done little but stay in the rear. Another found that the Cubans, quote, made very weak allies. A third wrote that the rebel army did little or no fighting and has borne no testimony to its desire to free Cuba. This is so fucked up. This is so fucked up. This was another piece of self-deception, but understandable? <laughs> That's what the book says. Few American correspondents had been in Cuba to watch as rebels built their power over a period of years, won broad popular support, and waged a highly successful guerrilla war. To most of these journalists, the war began only when American forces landed in the spring of 1898. None understood that Cuban units had secured the beaches where American soldiers landed. So they could only land there because Cuban soldiers had made it so. They're not soldiers, revolutionaries. Even the American naval commander there, Admiral William Sampson, said afterwards that the absence of Spanish troops on the beaches remains a mystery. <laughs> Other Cubans served as scouts and intelligent agents for the Americans, although they indignantly refused repeated demands that they work as porters and laborers. <laughs> uh, so these perfectly capable revolutionaries who were fucking kicking ass, like, secured the beaches so that people could land there. They were then like, yeah, hey, thanks for the help. Uh, we can help you, like, scout and, you know, get you some intelligence. And, and the Americans are like, hmm, what a mystery that this beach was empty. You there, you be my laborer. <laughs> it's like, I, you have to laugh because it's horrifying and disgusting behavior. To most Americans, war consisted of set-piece battles in which armies faced off. So just like one facing another and going, pew! They loved reading about charges like the one at San Juan Hill in which few Cubans participated. The long war of attrition that Cubans had waged unfolded far from the view of American officers and correspondents. Most of them did not realize that this campaign played, that this campaign played a decisive role in the victory of 1898. Once Americans convinced themselves that Cubans were cowards who had no idea of how to organize an army, uh, despite the fact that they had taken back almost the entire island, it was then easy for the Americans to conclude that Cuba was incapable of ruling itself. The American press never focused on the revolutionary leaders, some of whom were highly educated, experienced, and sophisticated. Instead, they portrayed the rebel force as an ignorant rabble composed largely of black people who were barely removed from savagery. As a result, McKinley and his allies in government and business had no trouble portraying them as equal to the Hawaiians in ignorance and stupidity, which we learned all about in chapter one. Uh, Self-government, General Shafter snorted when a reporter asked him about it. Why, these people are no more fit for self-government and gunpowder is for hell. <laughs> I barely know what that means. I, because if you took gunpowder into hell, it would just, like, explode? That's... okay. Whatever, Shafter. Keep snorting. Within days of the Spanish surrender, American officials began telling the Cubans that they should forget the promise of independence embodied in the Teller Amendment. President McKinley declared that the United States would rule Cuba under the law of belligerent right over conquered territory. Holy shit! So... <laughs> So Cubans took back the, almost the entire island from Spaniards. At the very end, American soldiers landed and were like, we're here to help. And they just kind of ran around being like, look what a good job we did based on what the Cuban revolutionaries had already done. Uh, but they only let the American soldiers land there after the American soldiers promised that they were just there to help and they would leave immediately after. And then as soon as they did that, they said, we conquered this territory. 
It's unbelievable. Attorney General John Griggs told the vice president of Cuba's provisional government that the U.S. Army in Havana was an invading, invading army that would carry with it American sovereignty wherever it went. The confusion that many Cubans felt as they heard these statements turned to in indignant anger when General Brooke refused to allow their liberating army to participate in the celebration planned for the first days of 1899. Many were dumbfounded. None of us thought that the American intervention would be followed by a military occupation of the country by our allies, who are treating us as a people incapable of acting for ourselves, and who have reduced us to obedience, to submission, and to a tutelage imposed by force of circumstances. General Maximo Gomez wrote, this cannot be our fate after years of struggle. Oh, it's so sad. <laughs> Most Americans had little regard for Cubans, so it was natural that they would reject such protests. Many even went further. They were angry that the Cubans had not fallen on their knees to thank the United States for liberating them. News correspondents reported that instead of embracing American soldiers, the Cubans seemed sour and sullen, conceited, vain, and jealous. One wrote of his astonishment to find that they were not filled with gratitude towards us. None seemed willing or able to understand how logical it was for Cubans to feel this way. They took the Cubans' resentment as further proof of their ignorance and immaturity. God, I hate these Americans so bad. Cuban patriots had for years promised that after independence, they would stabilize their country by promoting social justice. Americans wanted something quite different. Uh, General Leonard Wood wrote in a report to Washington soon after he assumed office uh, as a new military governor. The people ask me what we mean by stable government in Cuba. I tell them that when money can be borrowed at a reasonable rate of interest and when capital is willing to invest in the island, a condition of stability will have been reached. <laughs> That's the definition of stability. Fuck all the people who live here. Tell me about the capital. In a note to President McKinley, he was even more succinct. When people ask me what I mean by stable government, I tell them, money at 6%. God, fuck, fuck you so bad, General Wood. <laughs> Ugh, you want to talk about evil caricature? There's a cartoon villain right there. On July 25th, 1900, General Wood published an order calling for the election of delegates to a Cuban constitutional convention. Fewer than one third of the qualified, qualified voters turned out and even they refused to support many of the candidates that the Americans sponsored. General Wood described the 31 delegates as about 10 absolutely first-class men, and about 15 men of doubtful qualifications and character, and then about six of the worst rascals and fakirs in Cuba. What's faker? I don't know if it's faker or fakir. It's F-A-K-I-R. That's a word that kind of went away. Oh. It's apparently an Islamic term traditionally used for Sufi Muslim ascetics who renounce their worldly possessions and dedicate their lives to the worship of God. Okay, so it's just the name of like a person from a non-Christian religion and he's using it as an insult, even though it's not. That autumn, Secretary of War Elihu Root, who had been leading a corp who had been a leading corporate attorney in New York, and Senator Orville Platt of Connecticut, chairman of the Senate Committee on Relations with Cuba, wrote the law that would shape Cuba's future. The Platt Amendment, as it came to be known, is a crucial document in the history of American foreign policy. It gave the United States a way to control Cuba without running it directly by maintaining a submissive local regime. Washington would go on to apply this system in many parts of the Caribbean and Central America, where to this day it is known as Platismo. Under the Platt Amendment, the United States agreed to end its occupation of Cuba as soon as the Cubans, Cubans accepted a constitution with provisions giving the United States the right to maintain military bases in Cuba, the right to veto any treaty between Cuba and any other country, the right to supervise the Cuban treasury, and the right to intervene for the preservation of Cuban independence or the maintenance of a government adequate for the protection of life, property, and individual liberty. So that's, that's obviously double speak. <laughs> it's the right to 
essentially just the right to own everything and decide everything. Uh, so that best serves United States financial interests. In essence, the Platt Amendments gave Cubans permission to rule themselves as long as they allowed the United States to veto any decision they made. Members of Congress could not avoid realizing that by passing the Platt Amendment, they would be reneging on the pledge that they had made to Cuba less than three years before. Each had to ask himself a painful question that the New York Evening Post framed in a pithy editorial. Given a solemn and unmistakable promise of independence to Cuba, how can I lie out of it and still go to church to thank God that I am not as other men are? <laughs> Senators resolved this dilemma without evident difficulty. On February 27, 1901, they approved the Platt Amendment by a vote of 43 to 20. Republicans cast all the affirmative votes. Later, the House of Representatives joined in approval, also on a party line vote. President McKinley signed the amendment into law on March 2nd, and that plunged Cuba into what his one historian called a storm of excitement. And there's a quote from, who is this from? Oh, this is a quote from some historian. Havana was in turmoil on the night of March 2. A torchlight procession delivered a petition of protest to Wood at the governor's palace, and another crowd of demonstrators sought out the convention delegates and urged them to stand for firm in their op opposition to American demands. Similar demonstrations occurred on the following night. Outside the capital, municipal governments throughout the island poured out a flood of protest messages and resolutions, while public meetings were epidemic. On the night of March 5, speakers told a procession in Santiago that if the United States held to its demands, the Cubans must go to war once more. Yes, like, all of this just sounds like the perfect setup for the Cubans to just turn their kick kickassery towards the U.S. instead of Spain. But unfortunately, I know that that wouldn't go well for them because we have too much fucking money and guns. Even then. Cuban delegates to the Constitutional Convention had to decide whether to accept the Platt Amendment. American officials assured them that the United States wished no direct influence over Cuba's internal affairs, and also warned them that if they did not accept the Platt Amendment, Congress would impose even harsher terms. <laughs> We're not gonna hurt you unless you make us hurt you! <laughs> Motherfuckers. After long debate, much of it conducted behind closed doors, the Cuban delegates agreed, by a vote of 15 to 14, to do what the United States wished. Ah, that sucks. A year later, in an election, the Americans supervised, I wonder what that means, supervised, sniper rifles? Tomas Estrada Palma, who had lived for years in the town of Central Valley, New York, was chosen as the first president of the Republic of Cuba. General Wood, the military governor, who we hate, and by we I mean me, wrote in a private letter what every sentient Cuban and American knew. There is, of course, little or no independence left Cuba under the Platt Amendment. He said it out loud. The Puerto Rican poet Lola Rodriguez de Pio, who spent years in Cuba, once described these islands as two wings of the same bird. The expansionists in the United States agreed. As Theodore Roosevelt was preparing to sail for Cuba in the spring of 1898, he sent Senator Henry Cabot Lodge a letter warning. Do not make peace until we get to Puerto Rico. Or until we get Puerto Rico, okay? Don't make peace until we get the country. Lodge told him not to worry. Puerto Rico is not forgotten and we mean to have it, he assured his friend. Unless I am utterly and profoundly mistaken, the administration is now fully committed to the large policy we both desire. I gotta start making these, just like using villain voices for these fuckers. The island of Puerto Rico, which is less than one-tenth the size of Cuba, never erupted in armed rebellion against Spain. Like Cuba, though, it produced a remarkable group of revolutionary intellectuals who embodied the nationalism that seized many colonial hearts in the second half of the 19th century. For years, Spain resisted their calls for self-rule, but that changed when the reform-minded Praxidis Sagasta became prime minister in 1897. Soon after taking office, Sagasta offered autonomy to both Cuba and Puerto Rico. Cuban rebels, after with years of fighting behind them and thousands of men under arms, were bent on military victory and scorned his offer. Puerto Ricans, however, instantly accepted. <laughs> 
Puerto Ricans are generally jubilant over the news received from Spain concerning political autonomy, the American consul Philip Hanna wrote in a dispatch. The natives generally believe that Spain will grant them a form of home rule, as will be every way satisfactory to them. Spain's autonomy decree gave Puerto Ricans the right to elect a House of Representatives with wide-ranging powers, including authority to name a cabinet that would govern the island. They went to the polls on March 27, 1898. Most voted for the liberal fusion party of Luis Munoz Rivera, editor of the crusading newspaper La Democracia, and a passionate leader of the autonomy movement. The home rule government had not yet taken office when, in the pre-dawn hours of May 12th, a fleet of seven American warships took up in positions facing San Juan, the Puerto Rican capital. <coughs> At first light, the fleet's commander, Admiral Sampson, ordered his flagship, the Iowa, to open fire on Spanish positions. A desultory artillery duel followed. The Americans fired 1,362 shells and killed about a dozen people. Wait, how did they... Are we stormtroopers? How did we fire over 1,300 bullets and only kill 12 people? I mean, thank God. Was it? I guess it was just lay down, cover fire, or threaten, put out some threatening bullets, you know? Spanish defenders replied with 441 shells and several volleys of infantry fire, managing to kill one American soldier. Okay, so not much better with their aim. After three and a half hours, the guns fell silent. In military terms, this was a minor engagement, but it sent an unmistakable message. Puerto Rico would not be able to avoid being caught up in the Spanish-American War. For the next two months, American ships maintained a mostly effective blockade aimed at preventing the Spanish from sending supplies or reinforcements to their troops in Puerto Rico. The Spanish, though, were too focused on Cuba to pay much attention to, pay much attention to events on the smaller island, and so were the Americans. Hoping to take advantage of this situation, members of Puerto Rico's new House of Representatives convened for their first session on July 17th. Oh, hell yeah! <laughs> Damn, they kind of got lucky. Well, I don't know what's going to happen next, but like Cuba and Spain are fighting and Spain was like, hey, you're going to be un under our, our contract now. And they're like, okay, yeah, sure. And then both of the imperial powers are looking the other way and they're like, oh, hell yeah, let's have a meeting. Go, go, go. <laughs> Meeting time, make all the rules. On that same day, the new cabinet, headed by Munoz Rivera, began to function. It would hold power for just eight days. Oh, damn it. <laughs> eight days of freedom. At 8.45 on the morning of July 25th, a detachment of marines and sailors from the American gunboat Gloucester waded ashore near Guanica on Puerto Rico's southwestern coast. After a bit of shooting in which they suffered no casualties because they're stormtroopers, <laughs> They secured the town and raised the American flag over its customs house. Um, I mean, I guess I shouldn't. Um, I, you know, it's a good thing when less people die. So, but it's just uh, 1,300 bullets is a lot. The moment that flag began to flutter in the tropical breeze, the United States effectively took control of Puerto Rico. Every institution of Spanish rule, including the autonomous government, quickly withered away. Some Puerto Ricans look forward to the prospect of American rule. They hope for a period of nation building that might last 20 years or so, followed by, depending on their political persuasion, independence or annexation to the United States. Many were inspired by a generously worded proclamation that the American commander, General Nelson Miles, issued at the end of July. We have not come to make war upon the people of a country that for centuries has been oppressed, but on the contrary, to bring you protection. This is not a war of devastation, but one to give to all within the control of its military and naval forces the advantages and blessings of enlightened civilization. <laughs> Was that a good voice for General Miles? Uh, FYI, I think we have three more pages left in chapter two. The war in Puerto Rico was a sideshow almost completely overshadowed by the conflict in Cuba. American casualties were astonishingly light, just 9 dead and 46 wounded. The Spanish and Puerto Ricans lost a total of about 450 soldiers and civilians dead, wounded, or captured. One of the most prominent American correspondents who covered the war, Richard Harding Davis, later described it as, quote, a picnic and a fête de fleurs, which I don't even have to Google that one because it means party of flowers in French. 
fucking 450, well, I don't know, 450 dead, wounded, or captured. Uh, those are all bad things, and you should not describe that as a party of flowers, you fucking <laughs> inhumane colonizer. At the Paris Peace Conference of December 1898, where the terms of final surrender were fixed, Spain tried to retain Puerto Rico, arguing that the United States had never before challenged its sovereignty there. Sover Am I saying that word right? Sover sovereignty? Sovereignty. That's how you say it, isn't it? Whatever. Who cares? It's like, what language is that? I don't care about saying their words right. The Spanish even offered to give the United States territory elsewhere if they could keep Puerto Rico. President McKinley rejected all such suggestions. In private instructions to American negotiators, he said he had decided that Puerto Rico was to become the territory of the United States. The Spanish, defeated and weak, had no choice but to accept. On October 18th, at a formal ceremony on the balcony of the governor's palace in San Juan, Spanish commanders transferred sovereignty, so sovereignty <laughs> over Puerto Rico to, to the United States. It was all a quiet affair, the New York Evening Post reported. There was no excitement and but little enthusiasm. An hour after its close, the streets had assumed their wanted appearance. There was little to show that anything important had taken place, that by this brief ceremony, Spain's power on the island of Puerto Rico had ended forever. Thanks, New York Evening Post. No American alive in 1898 could have had any doubt about why the United States had gone to war with Spain. The conflict was fought to resolve a single question. Who would control Cuba? Conditions in Cuba led to the war. Cuba was the battleground. And Cuba was the prize. But when American and Spanish diplomats met in Paris to negotiate a treaty ending the war, they had to consider the fate of another land. One that was very large, unknown to Americans, and far distant from their shores. Cuba had exerted a hold on the American imagination for many years, at least since Thomas Jefferson wrote of his hope that it would one day become part of the United States. The Philippine Islands were quite another matter. Few Americans had the faintest idea of where they were. Nonetheless, as a result of Commodore Dewey's victory at Manila, the United States suddenly exercised power over them. No one had planned this. President McKinley had to decide what the United States should do with the vast archipelago. Ar archipelago? Archipelago? You know what I mean. McKinley was known above all for his inscrutability. He gave almost all the people he met the impression that he agreed with them and rarely allowed even his closest advisors to know what he was thinking. Oh God, I know, I hate those kinds of people. I've met those kinds of people. It's so scary, like master manipulators. Historians have described him as an enigma whose inner mind was well concealed and who obscured his views by a fog of phraseology, conventional or oracular obscured his views by a fog of fear. So he basically used a lot of words. He did like word salad so that you would think it meant something. At first, McKinley seemed to want only enough territory in the Philippines to build a naval base at Manila. Then he considered the idea of granting the islands independence, perhaps under an international guarantee. In the end, less worldly considerations dictated his decision. McKinley was a devout Christian living in an era of religious revivalism. He would later tell a group of Methodist missionaries that while he was wrestling with the Philippines question, he fell to his knees in the White House on several evenings and prayed Almighty God for light and guidance. That, that's a lie, based on what we know about how he's a master manipulator. One night late, it came to me this way, he said. There was nothing left for us to do but to take them all and to educate the Filipinos and uplift them and Christianize them, and by God's grace do the very best we could for them, as our fellow men, for whom Christ has also died. Yeah, what a fucking manipulator. He sounds like a, a manipulative uh, pastor, of which many are. <laughs> With that, the momentous decision was made. Historians still wonder why McKinley made it. He was deeply religious and may truly have felt moved by divine revelation. In a speech to the delegation he sent to negotiate in Paris, he gave another explanation, saying he was acting to seize the commercial opportunity to which American statementships cannot be indifferent. What is certain is that McKinley, in the words of one historian, knew the Filipinos not at all and would misjudge their response with tragic persistence. 
He himself admitted that when he heard news of Dewey's victory at Manila, he could not have told where these dawned islands were within 2,000 miles. His fervor to Christianize the Filipinos, most of whom were already practicing Catholics, <laughs> suggested his ignorance of conditions on the island. <laughs> he wanted to Christianize a bunch of people who were already Christianized by other colonizers. And he was trying to say, I'm saving them. Saving them from their heathen ways. <laughs> He certainly had no idea that they were in the throes of the first anti-colonial revolution in the modern history of Asia. Uh, Stanley Carno would later write in his History of the Philippines, The episode marked a pivotal point in the American experience. For the first time, U.S. soldiers fought overseas. And for the first time, America was to acquire territory beyond its shores, the former, colonary, co the former colony itself becoming colonialist. Um, so I guess we're now talking about the Philippines rather than Cuba. Is Cuba over? I don't know. So I guess these all kind of happen at the same time, so there's a lot going on. On May 1st, 1898, three weeks after destroying the Spanish fleet, Dewey welcomed the Filipino guerrilla leader Emilio Aguinaldo aboard his flagship, the Olympia. Their versions of what transpired are contradictory. Well, I trust the Filipino person, not the colonizer. <laughs> Aguinaldo said they agreed to fight the Spanish together and then establish an independent Republic of the Philippines. Colonizer Dewey swore that he made no such commitment. Neither man spoke much of the other's language and no interpreter was present. So the confusion is understandable. Okay, well, fair enough. <laughs> How could you even like proceed with anything if you don't speak the same language <laughs> without a translator? Of which it said there was none. Whatever the truth, when Aguinaldo declared the independence of the Philippines on June 12th, neither Dewey nor any other representative of the United States turned up at the ceremony. That's awkward. That snub led Aguinaldo and other Filipino leaders to fear that the United States would not recognize their country's independence. Well, partially that, partially they didn't even know what was going on. Like, they got, they got the invitation in Tagalog, and they were like, what's this? I don't know. <laughs> Put in the inbox. <laughs> General Thomas Anderson, a several Civil War veteran who was the first commander of American troops in the Philippines, sought to reassure them. I desire to have amicable, amicable relations with you, he wrote to Aguinaldo. Is he hitting on him? On July 4th. And to have you and your people cooperate with us in military operations against the Spanish forces. General Anderson may have been sincere, but as he was writing his letter to Aguinaldo, policy in Washington was changing. President McKinley, obeying what he took to be the word of God, or so he said, had decided that the United States should assume ownership not simply of an enclave at Manila, but of the entire Philippine archipelago. Sorry if I'm saying that one wrong. He directed his negotiators in Paris to offer the Spanish $20 million for it. Nice archipelago. I'll take it for 20 million. Spain was in no position to refuse, and on December 10th, American and Spanish diplomats signed what became known as the Treaty of Paris. Wait, that's what the Treaty of Paris is? Has there been more than one? I don't know. It gave the United States possession of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the distant Philippine archipelago, which had more than 7,000 islands and a population of 7 million. Wow! I did not know that. I didn't know the Philippines had more than 7,000 islands. That's a lot. On December 21st, McKinley issued an executive letter proclaiming American sovereignty over the Philippines. Rebels there were already proceeding along their own path. They had elected a constituent assembly that produced the constitution, and under its provisions, the Republic of the Philippines was proclaimed on January 23rd, 1899, with Aguinaldo as its first president. Twelve days later, this new nation declared war against the United States forces on the islands. McKinley took no notice. To him, the Filipinos were what the historian Richard Welch called a disorganized and helpless people. That's, that's extremely offensive. Um, there's a uh, paragraph from the historian. McKinley was, where well <laughs> McKinley was well aware of Aguinaldo's insurgents and their claims. It is probable that he still underestimated the extent of territorial control 
exercised by Aguinaldo's forces, but in McKinley's opinion, it was unimportant how much territory the insurgent government claimed. McKinley could not believe that Aguinaldo's insurgents would be so stupid as to resist the power and benevolence of the United States. McKinley seems to have entertained the self-contradictory notions that Aguinaldo was an evil, self-seeking bandit chieftain, and that could, he could be easily managed just like an office seeker in Canton, Ohio. <laughs> I hope he gets his comeuppance, but I doubt it. The Treaty of Paris gave the United States sovereignty over the Philippines, but it could not come into force until the Senate ratified it. The debate was long and heated. Opponents denounced the treaty as an imperialist grab of distant land that shamed American ideals and overextended American power. Senator George Frisbee Hoare of Massachusetts warned that it would turn the United States into a vulgar, commonplace empire founded upon physical force, controlling subject races and vassal states in which one class must forever rule and other classes must forever obey. Hell yeah, Senator George Frisbee Hoare. Damn. He was a real one. And he predicted accurately what happened. <laughs> what ended up happening forever. Supporters of the bullshit countered with three arguments. That it would be ludicrous to recognize Filipino independence since there was no such thing as a Filipino nation. And that it was America's duty to civilize the backwards Filipinos. And that possession of the archipelago would bring incalculable commercial and strategic advantages. As this debate was reaching its climax in what the New York world called an amazing coincidence, <laughs> news came that Filipino insurgents had attacked American positions in Manila. Hell yeah, get them. It later turned out that there had indeed been a skirmish, but that an American private had fired the first shot. Oh, hell no. That was not clear at the time, however, and probably would not have mattered anyway. Several senators declared that they now felt obligated to vote for the treaty as a sign of support for beleaguered American soldiers on the other side of the, glo the globe. Oh, hi, Willow. I didn't even know you were here. <laughs> no worries. Thanks so much for stopping by. See you uh, next week. Bye. Uh, okay, where was I? Do do do. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't have mattered. Several senators declared that they had to support it now. We come as ministering angels, not as despots, Senator Newt Nelson of Minnesota assured his colleagues. <laughs> this motherfucker called himself an angel. <laughs> also, let me Google what despot means. Is it despot or despo? D-E-S-P-O-T. Despot. A ruler or other person who holds absolute power, typically one who exercises it in a cruel or oppressive way. That is literally what you are. Senator Newt Nelson. Fucking angel. Please. Evidently convinced of that, the Senate ratified the Treaty of Paris by a margin of 57 to 27, barely more than the required two-thirds majority. President McKinley may well have believed that God wished the United States to uplift and Christianize the Filipino people. Speeches by senators during the treaty debate, along with many articles in the press, however, offered a more tangible rationale for taking the Philippines. Businessmen had become fascinated with the prospect of selling goods in China, which, after losing a war with Japan in 1895, had become weak and incapable of resisting intervention. They saw a magnificent confluence of circumstances as this land became available for exploitation at the same time they were casting desperately about for new markets. Uh, McKinley told Congress, We could not turn the Philippines over to France or Germany, our commercial rivals in the Orient. That would be bad business and discreditable. He told Congress that this as he was asking for ratification of the Treaty of Paris. When the United States assumed sovereignty over the Philippines, it inherited Spain's confrontation with the rebel army. Soldiers of the United States had never before fought outside North America, nor, with the arguable exception of the wars against Native Americans, had they ever fought against an army defending its country's independence. They had no idea of what they would be facing in their campaign against content warning for a slur, against what they called the Gugus, which is what they called the Filipinos, but they launched their war with supreme self-confidence. 
It began in February 1899 with a pitched battle for Manila. From the beginning, there was little doubt about how it would end. The insurgents had the advantage of numbers, but by every other standard, the Americans were clearly, clearly, quote, superior. Aguinaldo and his troops were crippled by a lack of weaponry enforced by an effective American naval blockade. So they didn't have great weapons and they couldn't get any more imported because there was a naval blockade. American soldiers landed in waves by the tens of thousands, eager to fight against an enemy of whose motivations they were blissfully unaware. <laughs> Imagine being a soldier and being just sent off and be like, hey, go kill those people over there and, and never saying why. I mean, I know you're taught. You're, they literally teach you. You don't question orders, but that's just wild. Just like kill whoever they tell you to kill. Crazy. Oh, and there's a... There's slurs here in the next sentence that I will not be saying. Um, and also that this is a used book and someone graciously uh, censored it in the book for me. Thanks, someone. Um, so these are in letters home. The American soldiers told friends and relatives that they had come to blow every slur to slur heaven and vowed to fight until the slurs are killed off like slurs. <laughs> Oof, the, these soldiers were the scum of the earth. Yes, you can cancel me for saying that. I don't care. Faced with these handicaps, the guerrillas turned to tactics unlike any the Americans had ever seen. They laid snares and booby traps, slit throats, set fires, administered poisons, and mutilated prisoners. The Americans, some of whose officers were veteran fighters against Native Americans, responded in kind. When two companies under the command of General Lloyd Wheaton were ambushed southeast of Manila, Wheaton ordered every town and village within 12 miles to be destroyed and their inhabitants killed. <sighs> so non-soldiers, just every woman and child. Because I, presumably the men were fighting if they could. So he just said kill every woman and children within 12 miles of where an uh, ambush happened against soldiers. During the first half of the Philippine War, American commanders imposed censorship on foreign correspondents to assure that news of episodes like this did not reach the home audience. <laughs> That's not the image we're looking for. Only after censorship was lifted in 1901 were Americans able to learn how the war was being waged. Newspapers began carrying reports like one filed early in 1901 by a correspondent from the Philadelphia Ledger. Our present war is no bloodless fake opera boof engagement. <laughs> what? Oh, wait, sorry. This is a report from a newspaper. Okay, I need a voice for this. But what is it saying? Okay, so I'm not going to make fun of this voice because I, because they're telling the truth. Our present war is no bloodless fake opera boof engagement. I don't know what boof means, but I'll look it up later. Our men have been relentless, have killed to exterminate men, women, children, prisoners, and captives, active insurgents, and suspected people, from lads of 10 and up, so children, an idea prevailing that the Filipino as such was little better than a dog. Oh, wait, never mind. Okay, I don't agree with what this is saying. I thought they were saying like, oh, this is bad, but I, I don't, I think they're just describing it. Um... Noisome reptile in some instances, whose best disposition was the rubbish heap. Our soldiers have pumped salt water into men to make them talk, have taken, excuse me, have taken prisoner people who held up their hands and peacefully surrendered, and an hour later, without an atom of evidence to show that they were even in Serectos, stood them on a bridge and shot them down one by one to drop into the water below and float down as an example to those who found their bullet-riddled corpses. Well, that was very disturbing. I'm glad that newspaper reporter was um, reporting accurately what our soldiers were actually doing. Though, the turning point in this war, and we've got, I think, one more page. Oops, wait, no. Oh, I miscounted earlier. We actually have two more pages now. The turning point in this war may have come on the afternoon of March 23rd, 1901, when a 36-year-old brigadier general named Frederick Funston, ooh, that's a fun last name, staged one of the boldest counter-guerrilla operations in American military history. 
Funston, who had won the Medal of Honor in Cuba three years earlier, was commanding a district on the island of Luzon when he received news extracted from a captured courier that Aguinaldo was encamped at a village in his district. He came up with the idea of using a group of Filipino scouts to help him penetrate the village and capture Aguinaldo. The scouts were from the Maccabebe ethnic group, which considered itself a rival of the Tagalogs, to which Aguinaldo and many other rebels belonged. General Funston and four other officers set out on their mission with 79 Maccabebe scouts. Let me make sure I'm saying that right. If I'm going to be saying it several times. Uh, Maccabebe pronunciation. I think I'll probably finish reading the chapter by 6 p.m. If not, slightly sooner. Um, <laughs> the <f> <laughs> The first result that came up is that it's pronounced roughly like make a baby. Would it really be make a and not maca? Is that correct? Make a maca. Make, make a baby. Make a baby. Okay, I'm just gonna go with that Google result. I mean, no offense if I'm saying it wrong. I'm always happy to be corrected. I want it. I just want to stay, say things right and with respect. Um, so 79 mecha baby scouts their plan was for the scouts to pose as rebels and tell aguinaldo that they were bringing him a group of american prisoners when the group was about 10 miles from aguinaldo's hideout he sent word that the americans should be kept away he did invite the rebels to come though and as his honor guard was welcoming them they suddenly began firing stop all the foolishness aguinaldo shouted from inside his headquarters don't waste ammunition one of the scouts turned, burst into Aguinaldo's office, and with pistol drawn told him, You are our prisoners. We are not insurgents. We are American. Surrender or be killed. Aguinaldo and his officers were too stunned to respond. Within minutes, they had been subdued and disarmed. General Funston appeared soon afterwards and introduced himself to the rebel leader. Is this not some joke? Aguinaldo asked. It was not. Aguinaldo was arrested and brought to Manila, which Funston later sent, went wild with excitement. Americans back home were thrilled with their new hero. Their satisfaction deepened when less than a month after Aguinaldo's capture, he issued a proclamation accepting American sovereignty and urging his comrades to give up their fight. And I'm sure that he was like tortured and kept under horrible circumstances to get him to issue that proclamation. Doesn't mention that here, but I'm sure that happened. Uh, several thousand of his comrades listened, leading the American commander in the Philippines, General Arthur MacArthur, to proclaim, pro <laughs> proclaim the rebellion almost entirely suppressed. He spoke too soon. Rebels who were still in the field fought with intensifying ferocity. In September 1901, a band of them overran an American position on the island of Samar with a brutality that set off some of the harshest countermeasures ever ordered by officers of the United States. The episode began with what seemed like a routine landing of infantrymen at a beach near the village of Balangiga. Some seemed to realize that they were in uncertain territory. As they approached the shore, one lieutenant gazed ahead and told his comrades, We are bound for Gugu land now. Apologies for the slur. Um, that is the title of the chapter. Pew, pew, pew. Title of the chapter noise. Uh, the Americans occupied Balangiga for several weeks, subduing it, <laughs> quote, according to later testimony, through imprisonment, torture, and rape. At dawn on the morning of September 28th, they rose as usual to the sound of revai, which I believe is a French word for like um, merriment, merriment making. A few remained on sentry duty while the rest ate breakfast. The town's police chief strolled up to one of the sentries, said a few pleasant words, and then suddenly produced a long knife and stabbed him. Immediately, the church bells began ringing. Scores of rebels who had infiltrated the town poured out of their hiding places. They fiercely set upon the unarmed Americans, stabbing and hacking them to death. Within minutes, the campground was awash in blood. Some Americans managed to escape in boats and made their way to a base 30 miles up the coast. Of the 74 men who had been posted in Balangiga, only 20 survived, most with multiple stab wounds. Good, because as we just heard, they had been torturing and raping the people of Balangiga. 
News of the, quote, Balangiga Massacre, which is ironic that they called it that because <laughs> the American soldiers massacred Balangiga and then the rebels massacred the Americans back. Anyway, uh, it was qu quickly flashed back to the United States. It stunned a nation that was only beginning to realize what kind of war was being fought in the Philippines. American commanders on the island were just as shocked, but they were in a position to react. And react they did. They ordered Colonel Jacob Smith, who had participated in the Wounded Knee Massacre in the Dakota Territory a decade before, to proceed to Samar and do whatever was necessary to subdue the rebels. Now remember, in the previous paragraph, subdue meant torture and rape. Smith arrived, took charge of the remaining garrisons, and ordered his men to kill everyone over the age of 10 and turn the island's interior into a howling wilderness. I vaguely remember that from school or something. I want no prisoners, he told them. I wish you to kill and burn. The more you kill and the more you burn, the better you will please me. Ugh, what a fucking villain. American soldiers carried out these orders with gusto. Um... Because remember, they're, the, the rebels killed soldiers when they, you know, responded. But he's telling them to kill everyone, women and children, except for those under 10. <laughs> they started by raising Balangiga and then rampaged through the countryside. Knowing that the assailants at Balangiga had disguised themselves as civilians, they took little care to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants. Is that really why, though? Because this is not the first time they did this. It's, it wasn't just because they were like, who knows who's the enemy? They're just... Nah. Fueled by a passion to avenge their, avenge their comrades, they killed hundreds of people, burned crops, slaughtered cattle, and destroyed dozens of settlements. During one long and amazingly ill-conceived march through the Samar jungle, 11 marines perished from a combination of starvation and exposure. Their captain, delirious and only intermittently conscious, became convinced that their Filipino porters had contributed to their deaths by withholding potatoes, salt, and other supplies. He singled out 11 of them, one for each dead marine, and had them shot. How many did they had more than 11 porters? And also, can you imagine the absolute worst fucking... Well, I was going to say jaw, but I guess they're essentially slaves, right? En enslaved people? Because there's no way they're doing that voluntarily or for money. Americans had used harsh tactics since the beginning of the Philippine War, but the summary execution of 11 Filipinos who were working for them and who had committed no apparent crime was too much for commanders to ignore. They ordered the offending officer court-martialed on charges of murder. He was eventually acquitted, but the case set off an explosion of outrage in the United States. Under this episode, many Americans had believed that their soldiers were different from others, operating on a higher moral plane, because their cause was good. After Balangiga, however, a flood of revelations forced them out of their innocence. Newspaper reporters sought out returned veterans and from their accounts, learned that American soldiers in the Philippines had resorted to all manner of torture. The most notorious was the water cure, in which sections of bamboo were forced down the throats of prisoners and then used to fill the prisoners' stomachs with dirty water until they swelled in torment. <clears throat> Um, a little late here, but um, trigger warning for description of torture. <laughs> it, uh, it continues. Soldiers would then jump on the prisoner's stomach to force the water out, often repeating the process until the victim either informed or died. This technique was so widely reported in the United States that the Cleveland Plain Dealer newspaper even published a joke about it. Here's the joke. Ma. What's the sound of running water out there, Willie? Willie. It's only us boys, Ma. We've been trying the Philippine water cure on Bobby Snow, and now we're pouring him out. That's somehow a joke. Others took the matter more seriously. We have actually come to do the thing we went to war to banish, the Baltimore American l lamented. The Indianapolis News concluded that the United States had adopted the methods of barbarism, and the New York Post declared that American troops have been pursuing a policy of wholesale and deliberate murder. Okay, this is like a really good example of something that I always 
try to remind people of when people are like, oh, it's a, he's a person of their, his time. There are people of their time. You know, everyone, everyone was racist and murderers back then. It's not fucking true. In every instance, there was always people speaking out against bullshit. There was always non-racist people even when we had people who were enslaved there were still plenty of people that were like no this is fucked up actually and not not a small minority a significant number of people um so this is a good example of that there was people that were like dude this is fucked up just like just like i am right now david Starr jordan the president of stanford university declared that filipinos had done more than had done no more then rebel against alien control and that therefore it was our fault and ours alone that this war began. Exactly. The revered Harvard professor William James said that Americans were guilty of murdering another culture and concluded one of his speech by declaring, God damn the U.S. for its vile conduct in the Philippines. Hell yeah, preach. Mark Twain suggested that the time had come to redesign the American flag, with the white stripes painted black and the stars replaced by skull and crossbones. <laughs> Metal. <laughs> Might as well give these Americans a pirate flag since they're fucking pillaging. This spasm of recrimination continued for several months, but soon a counter campaign began. Defenders of American policy, who at first were too overwhelmed by the onslaught of horrific revelations to respond, finally found their voice. Extreme conditions, they insisted, had forced soldiers to act as they did. <laughs> they they had to torture and rape them. They were really hot. <laughs> like, the weather was hot. <laughs> the New York Times argued that brave and loyal officers had reacted understandably to the cruel, treacherous, murderous Filipinos that you were, whose country you were fucking invading. The St. Louis Globe Democrats said that American soldiers had done nothing in the Philippines that they had not done during the Civil War, which <laughs> is not a good argument. And that in view of the provocation received and the peculiar nature of the task to be performed, the transgressions have been extremely slight. The Providence Journal urged its readers to accept the wisdom of fighting fire with fire. Um, it's not fighting fire with fire when you're invading a fucking country that doesn't want you there, doesn't need you there, and you're calling them slurs and saying that they don't can't take care of themselves. No. No. A second theme that echoed through the press was that any atrocities committed in the Philippines had been aberrations. So, not par for the course. Just some, just some little aberrations. They were deplorable, the St. Paul Pioneer Press conceded, but they had no bearing on fundamental questions of national policy. The New York Tribune said only a few soldiers were guilty. That sounds familiar. Only a few bad apples. And the penalty must not fall upon the policy, but upon those men. Just those couple of guys. By the time this debate reached its crescendo in the early months of 1902, President McKinley had been assassinated. Oh, I didn't... No, that happened. Well, now I just want to go Google that. Yeah, I, uh, I only have one more paragraph before the chapter is over. And we've got 10 minutes to 6 p.m., which means I'm going to Google. How was President McKinley assassinated? He was assassinated on September 14th, 1901 in Buffalo, New York. There's some images of a man being stabbed. So it seems to have been a stabbing. There's why. Uh... Sol Guts, a Polish immigrant, grew up in Detroit and worked as a child laborer in a steel mill and as a young adult. He gravitated towards socialist and anarchist ideology. He was claimed, to, oh, he claimed to have killed McKinley because McKinley was the head of what uh, was a corrupt government. Fair enough. Sure was. <laughs> Continues to be so corrupt, I mean. Oh, no, he was shot. Wait, why are these pictures of a stabbing if he was shot? Oh, did he, like, hold the gun up to his chest and just shoot him point blanc? Oh, this is too hard to read. Okay. Anyways, he was um, assassinated, and there's a bunch of pictures of it if you want to check it out online. <laughs> they're, they're drawings. Sorry, not photographs. Okay, last paragraph. Uh, where, where was I? Okay, so he was assassinated and he was replaced by Roosevelt. 
To Roosevelt fell the task of defending the honor of the troops he loved, and he embraced it, even though he had never been enthusiastic about the Philippine operation. He enlisted his close friend and ally, Henry Cabot Lodge, to lead the defense. In a long and eloquent, eloquent speech on the Senate floor, Lodge conceded that there had been cases of water cure, of menaces of shooting unless information was given up, of rough and cruel treatment applied to secure information. But Americans who lived in sheltered homes far from the sound and trials of war, he warned, could not understand the challenges of bringing law to a semi-civilized people with all the tendencies and characteristics, <laughs> characteristics of Asiatics. So he was just blatantly racist against Asian people. Let us, oh let us be just, at least to our own, Lodge begged the Senate. At Roosevelt's suggestion, Lodge arranged for the Senate to, to hold hearings into charges of American misconduct in the Philippines. Um, so he was saying, okay, let's let's uh let's hear what they have to say okay you know let's quiet down all the people that are angry by uh holding hearings about american misconduct it was a clever move because lodge himself ran the hearings and he carefully limited their scope there was much testimony about operational tactics but no exploration of the broader policy that lay behind them the committee did not even issue a final report so they literally just went in there he did gave leading testimony that a man who wanted them to all be fine led one historian described the work of this uh, committee as less a whitewash than an exercise in sleight of hand uh, so just full-on deception on July 4th, 1902, soon after the investigating committee ended its work, President Roosevelt declared the Philippines pacified. He was justified in doing so. The important guerrilla leaders had been killed or captured, and resistance had all but ceased. It had been a far more costly operation than anyone had predicted at the outset. In three and a half torturous years of war, 4,374 Americans were killed. American soldiers were killed, more than 10 times the toll in Cuba, about 16,000 guerrillas, and at least 20,000 civilians were killed. 16,000 um, insurgents defending their country, 20,000 civilians, Filipino civilians just trying to live in their country. Filipinos remember those years as some of the bloodiest in their history. Americans quickly forgot that the war ever happened. And that concludes chapter two. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode two of Riff Raff Reads, a uh, show where we um, catchphrase, well, what's my catchphrase? <laughs> where we read the things you want to know but you won't read alone. Hey. Uh, we will continue with chapter three next stream, which could be next Sunday or could be on any other Sunday. Um, I will stream at least once a month. Um, probably always on Sundays. Oh yeah, thanks. I wasn't sure if you're still here. Diabetic DM. Thanks for hanging out. Any any thoughts, you know, any processing? you have to share in the chat for what we learned today. <laughs> I want to be able to put notes. Yeah, that's fucked up. <laughs> Final thoughts? That's fucked up. <laughs> that's going to be the tagline of every chapter in this book. Oh, sure. Um, I wanted to be able to... I don't know if you've seen my uh, lay layout yet. To use the... Uh, whiteboard as a as a whiteboard but I wasn't able to get it to work um, partially because I would have to go like draw on it and then I wouldn't be reading <laughs> but in theory I can use that whiteboard and actually draw on it someday okay well I will catch y'all later perhaps on another Sunday and um, all these recordings will also go up on YouTube. If you miss a chapter, you can always catch up. And 
Thanks so much for stopping by. See you next time.